there is a woman who um, just has a resume that doesn't end and who has saved so many children by way of her diagnostic work with those children, her interaction with the schools, with educators. And I um, am much richer as an educator because I've had this association with Dr. Martha Dankla. Please join me in welcoming her to Towson University. Needless to say, nobody should ever accept an invitation to talk after Ben Carson. But, uh, <laughs> and you know, actually, it made me think of one uh, anecdote. Um, uh, he, of course, has saved many lives. And I'm in a field, I'm in this funny little corner of neurology where it intersects with uh, psychology and education, et cetera. And uh, I think those of you who are parents will appreciate this story. I'm glad you said something about saving children. <laughs> um, my middle son uh, went to Columbia and uh, was on the train coming home uh, for one, first winter break when he was a freshman. Came home to, I live in Bethesda, still do, after 25 years working in Baltimore, but that's another story. But uh, at any rate, when you have children who are doing well in a certain school system, you don't move. That's the, <laughs> that's the real. <laughs> so. Um, What's up? Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, <clears throat> he was sitting there, and of course I have a very odd last name. It's my married name. And uh, the, the boys uh, who were coming home from college didn't know each other, exchanged names. And when this other young uh, student heard my name, he said, oh, I, your mother, your mother's the neurologist, right? And uh, my son said, yes. And then he said, your mother saved my life. And my son broke into, <clears throat> you know, ridiculing type of laughter. He said, oh, no. She, he said, my mother doesn't do anything physical to people. She hasn't saved anyone's life since she was an intern. Uh, what he meant was that I had evaluated him and found that he had terrible developmental dysgraphia. And I had all the documentary testing that showed that this was really a, a central nervous system problem. And so I had said, forget the writing except for numbers, because we don't have any word processing for writing our math, and let him do the rest of his high school career with word processing. And in the, in the eyes of this young man, that saved his life. So it's interesting, you know, there's such a thing as quality of life, and that's what I've been privileged to be working uh, on for so many years. And I've been doing the traditional um, three-part academic career. That means I've always been a salaried doctor at uh, three different universities uh, with a little interlude at the NIH, which means that I've always had one day a week and only one day a week to see children uh, with learning and attention problems. And the rest of the time I've been doing research and of course in the process of that, um, uh, mentoring and teaching uh, younger people. And for the last three years, I've also been teaching teachers. I got very assertive and I marched myself over to uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Ed and I said, I want to teach teachers about the brain. So that's my, that's my uh, career stage right now. Just using what I've learned over the preceding uh, three decades. So what I want to talk to you about today is, uh, I'm so grateful to Dr. Car uh, Carter for having mentioned executive function. I want to talk to you about executive attention and its impact on reading. Uh, was that my first one? Okay. Um, we have this entity, how many people here have heard of ADHD? Maybe, yes, okay. And a lot of people, right off the bat, I want to explain that, that um, ADD is not an officially sanctioned term. We all use it, uh, but it's actually um, uh, ADHD with a comma, and then you have to say predominantly inattentive. Uh, but anyway, we keep saying ADHD just because that's the official uh, umbrella. Um, and um, ADHD uh, is a genuine condition. That's one of the things I want to get across. Uh, lots of people in my social life will come up to me and say, 
is this a real thing? Uh, isn't it just uh, a fad or isn't it just bad parenting? And I do agree that uh, it's better to think of a lot of people as being at risk for ADHD and if they get the optimal environment, they may not have any impairment, uh, but if they get uh, anything far from optimal, even in some cases adequate, they will show manifestations. We've done a lot of research over the past 25 years because we've had MRI. When you see the little A in front of MRI, it means anatomical MRI. And I just want to tell you, since Dr. Carson set things up, that we have evidence for actual smaller uh, or thinner uh, lobes of the brain in the frontal lobe, also in the basal ganglia, uh, and the cerebellum has now come in. All of these uh, different chunks of brain have been found to be uh, under-endowed in children with uh, ADHD. And also with functional MRI, we found that the uh, basal ganglia are underactivated and that um, uh, the medication, the, the formal name methylphenidate is a chemical name for Ritalin, uh, actually works uh, through the basal ganglia. So I just want to give you an idea that there's a lot of science here. And uh, our own group has shown that the shapes of the caudate uh, and uh, its next door neighbor, which is more of a motor structure, are uh, differently, oddly compressed. But basically, the bottom line is that these boys with ADHD have less tissue in these parts of the brain. And actually, I'll tell you, I, I couldn't make a slide of this because I just found it out this morning. We have been trying for years to find something with girls with ADHD in the same uh, elementary school age group. We finally have some findings in the frontal lobe with girls with ADHD. Um, and this means, really, for 20 years we've been trying to find something, so we finally found something. <laughs> uh, the boys are much easier to find something uh, deviant about. But, <laughs> no, I mean uh, different from their peers. <laughs> I don't mean deviant in, in some other way. Okay, so it shows, however, what's very encouraging is that fMRI does show normal sensitivity to rewards in children with ADHD. Uh, that's not true of conduct disorder, but and I think people over-identify ADHD as being bad kids, so I want to make it very clear that that's not what we mean by ADHD. But um, uh, you really can get plenty of good results if you hit those rewards or pleasures, as Dr. Carter was saying, with children with ADHD, and it's a very major, major uh, important thing to know about them. Um, now, also, medication is not a bad thing. It's not a cure, but it's not a curse, uh, because a group at the NIH that's been able to do uh, anatomical imaging year after year after year has been able to show that the cortical thickness uh, is closer to typically developing peers uh, when you treat them than when you have children whose parents refuse to allow them to be treated. It doesn't mean that it makes them normal, but they are a lot closer to normal if they have had medication. That's not because medication directly worked on the brain. It's because medication made the children available for experiences that made all those repeated connections Dr. Carter was, uh, Carson was talking about. So if you get your foot in the door with this medication, you then have the ability to sculpt the brain, in other words, to get those neurons that fire together to wire together, and therefore the brain looks much more like that of typically developing peers. Um, also, we have some good news. Uncomplicated ADHD uh, probably is a developmental lag. You know, we do a lot of talking about developmental delay, but what, that's really just a description. We really just don't know whether some people are going to catch up, but we have some evidence of catch up in the brain of children with ADHD. However, it's about a three-year lag. So what I like to leave you with is the optimism that they may catch up. Uh, but the cortical thickness that their friends have in the second grade, they don't get that till the fifth grade. 
Now, if we start middle school in the sixth grade, which I could spend the whole rest of my time telling you how we do everything prematurely in education, but certainly we're, we're throwing, we're taking kids who have just gotten the second grader level of frontal lobes, and then we're sending them to middle school when they've barely, it would be like, you know, somebody who's just barely started to walk and we've decided that they have to go try out for the baseball team. So we are, we are, uh, we're not taking our data about the underlying physical lags and, and using it appropriately. So we have a lot of reason uh, to believe that most children with uncomplicated ADHD, what I mean by uncomplicated is that it was just something that happened because of some genetic pattern of development. Someday I think it might even be like when you get your second teeth, you know? I mean, how many people here uh, uh, were uh, relatively uh, late in their second teeth? Do you know? I, I know I was. For example, I got, I got my wisdom teeth. They came in when all my friends were having theirs pulled out. <laughs> so, you know, that's a, it's, it, it was, I was on a very, and uh, you know, one reason why I, I'm, I'm no longer as tall as I used to be, with age, but the reason I was a very, I was a 99th percentile height was because I had very late puberty also. So there are a lot of timing events in our physical genetic code that will lead, in some cases it's not, I mean, I didn't like being as tall as I was, but it wasn't exactly a tremendous handicap, nor was the fact that my wisdom teeth came in when I was 19 or something. Uh, but if your frontal lobes come in three years later than everybody else, even though you are normal after that, you have already been at a tremendous disadvantage for many, many years of your life. Because when you were in preschool, you were a terror, and uh, maybe you settled down physically and you were uh, not a terror anymore in elementary school, but you were not able to concentrate and to plan and to manage your time and to do all these things that other people could do because they had the brain structural and brain connection basis of the things they were asked to do. I'm going to skip some of these. Um, now, what is executive function? We first began to look at executive function because we knew from adult neurology that the frontal lobes were very important. And we also saw with our imaging that in ADHD, the frontal lobes were um, very commonly not as well developed as they should be for the age of the children with ADHD. And there's a very important book by Barclay that explains executive functions developmentally. The first thing you see in the uh, process of, uh, of executive function is inhibition. Inhibition is simply the ability to not do something. Now that sounds crazy, like why is that important? Well, the wonderful researcher named Adele Diamond who shows that if you put a teddy bear into a plexiglass, you know, completely transparent box, it has an opening on one end. You put it in front of a baby who can sit up. Baby six months old, seven months old, eight months old the baby will get very frustrated because the baby can see the teddy bear through the transparent plastic box and will keep on reaching for it and the little hand will bang up against this clear wall. A wonderful, fantastic thing happens around nine months. You'll see the little chubby hand go out and it kind of stops in midair and it begins to feel around on the box and discovers there's an opening and it can get out the teddy bear but you had to stop before you could explore. If you just went reflex, 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 I see it, I reach for it, you could never develop a strategy. So inhibition, which comes in for the first time towards the end of the first year of life and continues and continues and continues, you have to be able to stop in order to look and listen. So stop is very important. It's very important in converting us from a reflex type of creature into one who can reflect and explore. So that's very important. Um, 
You know something funny? This is not what I want. This presentation here is not the one that I really wanted to, uh, that I have here. It's on a related topic, but remember I sent you two things? I'm going to see whether the other one is in here. Nope. I'm sorry, but what I've got here planned to talk about and what's on here is not the same thing. But I'll just have to, I'll have to adjust to that. We made a choice, and we we got this is we we don't have the one that we really wanted because the one that I wanted was going to be much much more zooming in on reading. But I'm going to just have to go with what I have here because I think otherwise um, you're going to get conf too confused. So what we've set up is executive function starts off with inhibition, but it's not just inhibition. It's also processing speed, very important thing that teachers deal with all the time and uh, what we now call the motor end of phenotype. Uh, the writing problems are very common with kids with ADHD. But it's very important for um, teachers to recognize that although it sounds like you're contradicting yourself, especially if you leave that word hyperactive in there, most kids with ADHD are slow processors. We don't quite understand this, but we have a lot of data accumulating that processing speed is one of their tremendous problems. Um, now, is executive dysfunction actually diagnostic of ADHD? No. It's not even, I get these phone calls all the time from my clinic where people say, um, I've been told my child has executive function disorder. I say, well, that's nice, but it's not in the diagnostic and statistical manual. There is ADHD, but there is no disorder called, ADHD, uh, called executive dysfunction. It's not a diagnosis, but it is the cognitive link between what we see about the frontal lobe in these kids as researchers and what in the classroom you're going to see as somebody who lacks efficiency as a student. This is why it's so important, because every single aspect of executive function is the, what runs the show for a person being a successful student. Think of it as all the things that are in the driver's seat when you are in the car. The child's intelligence is like everything that's under the hood of the automobile. That's all the potential of the vehicle. But the executive function is everything that you sit in that driver's seat and use that potential to go, to stop. Again, think of inhibition as the brakes. Think how important the brakes are to a car. You know, if you've ever tried to drive a car that was showing insufficient braking power, you know you can't take a corner the way you want to. You certainly are in danger if you can't stop when you need to. So the brakes are important, but also uh, the steering is important. Also, knowing whether you should be going in, if you have a gear shift, it's very important to know what gear you should be in. Uh, if weather conditions change, you have to plan to use the appropriate windshield wipers or uh, switch your uh, flow of air so that it defrosts your front window. All of these things make the potential of that car into an actual useful vehicle. So a child who has a high IQ, who has everything under the hood, has language skills, has perceptual skills, has memory skills, but none of it is under control. It's all kind of uh, at the mercy of road conditions, so to speak, is going to have a tremendous amount of trouble with almost all school subjects. So executive dysfunction is not a diagnosis, but in educators' terminology, it is a set of processing problems. It's not processing confined to a specific content area. Now, People, however, sometimes are very talented in one thing. So someone who's a tremendous natural at certain things can get by with half an eye and half an ear and very little planning and very little strategy for quite a few years. But if you're just average in your endowment, you're going to have to have all of these control and organizational capabilities. Um, the executive function has to have a feed in from the back part of the brain. You have to have that part of the brain that was pointed out to you as being the temporal lobes and the parietal lobes sending all the good information and content to the frontal lobes in order for it to be acted upon. So certainly we have 
and I've spent years researching dyslexia, we have people who have weaknesses in some of the, what we call the server areas from the back of the brain. You can also think of it another way if you don't like car analogies. So you can think of executive function as being like the recipe book and the uh, specific abilities and talents that make up our IQ, or make up multiple IQs, if you like Howard Gardner's model, as being the contents of our cupboards and our refrigerator. But if you don't have recipes, you may end up with a mess. And my favorite image about disexecutive people of any age, children or adults, is that they're the people who start doing the things on the recipe without reading what all the ingredients are. So when it gets to the point where it says room temperature butter, and you are running into the freezer and trying to stick it in the microwave just long enough to make it, you know, and it ends up being, uh, you know, butter that you can use to uh, saute your vegetables in, but not room temperature. That, that's, the, that's the image of a person who is, uh, has lots of ingredients but does not follow a recipe and does not plan ahead. Now, what do we see clinically? We see problems with inhibit, sustain, initiate, and shift, which conveniently spells ISIS. So when I teach my residents, I can teach them. Those are, those are the four sort of gear shifts, basically, of executive function. You also see a lot of motoric immaturity. If we had Dr. Carson's brain here, I'd show you the back end of the frontal lobe is the motor part. That's the most first one to develop after you're born, and it's the motor strip. So it's in the neighborhood. And the executive system is what makes you be able to do very fancy things with your motor system. So you find that almost all of the children who are in elementary school anyway are going to show motor problems and handwriting is a very prominent one. So almost always that's another straw that breaks the camel's back is that not only do they not have the good executive function from the more advanced part of the frontal lobe but the back end of the frontal lobe isn't terribly good either and uh, particularly for handwriting, which is an extremely, extremely difficult neurological activity. Um, I, I'll tell you how you can, I can always remember how this is proven. When I was a resident in neurology, we used to do consults to the medical service. They would call us all the time and say, we think Mr. Jones, who's here for his liver or he's here for his kidneys, uh, he's had a, we asked him to sign a consent form for a procedure, and he couldn't write his name. We think he must have had a stroke. Turned out not to be true. That if a person was in renal failure, that's kidney failure, or a person was in liver failure, and toxicity was affecting their brain, before anything else was obviously wrong, they couldn't write anymore. That's how delicate a function and how difficult a function writing is. And uh, I really want to impress that on people. We, we just don't give it enough respect. In fact, we don't teach it. We can also go off in a whole thing about why we should be teaching cursive and not teaching printing, whole big neuro. And I'd be happy to entertain questions about that, too, because I have very strong feelings about how we do not respect uh, both how difficult writing is how much it really would have to be learned, and also when we should back off and wait for signs of maturity. Obviously, executive function mainly means these fancier things like visual motor organization. Like if you give somebody a complex geometric figure to copy, can they get it on the page so that it has some resemblance to what they're copying? Even if we've proved that they can perceive it, which we do by multiple choice testing and lack of strategies or plan of search. You can get a very bright child with ADHD and give them a page on which you just say, I want you to find all the A's on the page, or all the threes, and then you have non-target letters or numbers. And they're arranged in rows. Other children will go across like this. Kids with ADHD will go blah, 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 blah. They don't tune into the structure being afforded to them. 
So they jump, 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 jump all over the page. It's just an amazing thing to see. So it's not intelligence, but it's a plan of search. How am I going to do things? And then, of course, time management, when am I going to do things, is another aspect. Now, we put a lot of stock on assessing executive function in younger children through their motor system. We use the, what I call, where there's smoke, there's fire. I sincerely believe, if somebody will let me do this, that I could go into a pre-K, a four-year-old group, and I can just tell you from the motor status who is at risk for ADHD and how maybe we ought to think about how we do a behavior management plan with that kid before the, uh, we give him enough rope to hang himself, which is giving too much independence to a child who can't handle it too young is really killing with kindness or that other metaphor, giving somebody enough rope to hang himself. Because the motor system will hang out a little red flag that says this frontal lobe and its interconnections is not maturing at the same rate, not only as the rest of the class, but the rest of the child. And it becomes a really difficult thing for a child uh, who is perhaps otherwise very brilliant uh, to cope with the fact that he, it's usually a he, still four to one, boys to girls, um, that he cannot make things happen uh, which he can perceive and name and do lots of other things with, but the motor system is not doing his or her bidding. So even without anyone else criticizing, that child is going to have already a sense of frustration. And possibly, if they do get to school and have demands placed on them that they're not ready to do, uh, are going to decide that they and school are not compatible with each other. As, as Dr. Carson said, a child who's brilliant can still decide because he can't put something on paper that he is a dummy. And then you have a whole huge cloud of the issue of negativity about school uh, because you've asked the person to do something uh, he's not only not able to do, but doesn't live up to his own standards. We also have a wonderful, if the child's at least eight years old, and this goes from age eight to age 80, we have something called the Dallas Kaplan Executive Function System. Uh, Edith Kaplan was the person who trained me initially. Uh, and this is a wonderful set of tests that will specifically address executive function and is very sophisticated and it's an awful lot of fun to give. The other thing is that people enjoy taking it too. <laughs> it's very full of novelty. So actually, it's, uh, you know, it's funny, I, uh, when I first started doing assessments for uh, uh, ADHD kids in my clinic, I used to, took some of the research things, and a lot of them are these um, computer, uh, continuous performance tests on computers, and they're like, push the button when you see this, don't push when you see that, and they would run 20 minutes at a time. We got interesting research results with it, so I put them in the clinic. The kids hated it so much. You could hear them going out the door and saying, I'm never going back to visit that doctor again. So you begin to learn that there are certain, certain tests that may be very pure research instruments, but they're not going to have much of a longevity in your office because if the consumer is that uh, aversively conditioned by them, you're not going to use them. Now, you still need to have vigilance for language. Because, you know, basically, I could say two things to you and say, what does it take to be a successful learner, excellent language foundation, and executive function? Those are the two things you need to be a successful learner in school. I'm not saying a successful learner for maybe uh, things, I'm trying to think of all the things we have to learn later in life. Well, one thing, for example, I have never learned because I have poor spatial ability is uh, parking a car in a, not, not in a pull-in space the way most of the malls, but parking on a New York street, you know, for, you know, estimating do I have enough room for my car and getting it in. I'm, I'm terrible at that. So one thing I, I would say is that I agree with Dr. Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences because a lot of us have experiences that uh, we have some piece of Dr. Gardner's uh, lazy Susan, I call it, uh, that we don't have much in some of those trays. And, uh, but, uh, 
And, uh, you know, it gives you a lot of empathy with kids with learning disabilities because if they don't have much in the language tray, they are going to have a heck of a time in school. Um, and they, they may be much, much better than you are at parking a car. But unfortunately, uh, you know, they're not going to be in such a position to laugh. Another example in my own life is when I was eight years of age, I was thrown out of a ballet class. Uh, my mother was four foot eleven. I, in my prime, was five ten and a half. Uh, so when, even when I was a little girl, I was never a little girl. I was, I was always a head taller. Uh, when I appeared in a play in the second grade, my father was outraged to hear one lady w whispering to the other, "Why are they letting that retarded girl into this play?" <laughs> because I was so much bigger than everybody else. But uh, so the, I was not. I was not in doubt. First of all, I was very right-left confused. And second of all, I was very klutzy. And third of all, I stuck out like a sore thumb. So the ballet teacher told my mother she was not going to let me come back anymore because I did the wrong thing going in the wrong direction. And I was so large that I, I must have looked like the Carol Burnett show or something. You know, I was <laughs> knocking everybody. But, but you see, we can, all, we can enjoy a good laugh about that. But what if that same missing ingredient were something to do with a required school subject? Other than my mother kind of tis tisking at me, my mother's answer to everything was, you didn't try hard enough, of course. But we can, we can survive that if we're not talented at uh, ballet or not a great athlete. But we do have people who have lesser endowment uh, and I, I like to emphasize that a lot of the things we do for school skills are really kind of like specialized talents. And we somehow decide that everybody's got to do them. So no wonder we have a certain percentage of people who are struggling with them. But executive function is extremely important for compensating. Uh, going further in my own life, I actually got involved with musical theater when I was in high school. And darned if I couldn't learn to do all those dance steps when I was motivated uh, as, as part of musical theater. So uh, you can have a lack of talent. Uh, you may not be able to uh, do something as elegant as ballet, but you can work around it. And the same is true for many of our learning disabled. But you have to have that executive function. You have to say, hmm, I can't do ballet, but I bet you I could do, you know, a little song and dance routine with my, you know, one leg has to go in rhythm behind the other and in front of, the, you know, and practice it and you can do it. But you have to have that executive function as a compensatory mechanism. I'm going to, uh, okay, sustaining and shifting, planning, organizing, and something that you heard from Dr. Uh, Carson. And I want you to reserve metacognition for that. Remember when he said that the guy said that he was not good enough for med school? And he said, I'm going to sit down and analyze my learning style. That's meta. We should reserve meta for that level, which is know thyself. And too often, we, we, we throw around metacognition too, uh, below that level, and we leave nothing for that ultimate level, which is you having this overview of yourself and how you're going to strategize to optimize what you need to do to succeed. So I just want to advertise meta applies to monitoring yourself, checking on yourself, having insight, ultimately. Um, there are also implicit executive function deficits. Uh, as I said, inhibition is the earliest one. Initiation, because you got to get started. Uh, uh, also, uh, controlling your emotions, setting your emotions aside in order to deal with a situation where showing your emotions would sink the ship. Uh, that's a very important kind of, of executive function. Um, I had a, a mentoring session which showed the opposite. A, a young woman I'm mentoring in her earlier stages at Kennedy Krieger, there's somebody else that was brought on board who's in her field, and she's very threatened. And so I said, let's sit and strategize. You should invite her to lunch. You should get to be friendly with her. You know, you should see where you have common interests. So that would be using your executive function not 
in an in a inhibitory way, but in an actual strategizing social way uh, that you will set up a network with this person where you both are in a win-win situation. Um, so you can see how very important the executive functions are. And here's what I was alluding to. I took Howard Gardner's uh, big circle, and uh, it turned out elliptical because I couldn't make the program have it, uh, uh, you know, it just, it, it's meant to be like a lazy Susan that you have nowadays mainly in Chinese restaurants. And um, the executive function is like that mechanism that would make all the different little compartments come around to different people. Um, so you look at all these different things, language, symbolic, analytic, very familiar for schooling. Uh, two kinds of visual perception, the where system and the what system. Very interesting. We didn't know that until 25 years ago that your visual perception is not a lump sum, that there's visual perception for where things are in relation to each other. <coughs> and then there's object perception, like face recognition. And I personally, I'm trying to drum up some interest. I think this is where people are good spellers or not. If they can learn to look at irregular words and say it looks right or it doesn't look right. I, and I don't think it's been investigated enough. So that's visual perception for um, uh, a whole complex something. And I just read an article this week that says the inferior temporal lobe has a dedicated section for sort of taking in a visual object at a gulp as a whole thing, and faces are the prototype, but I bet you words, especially words that do not yield to phonic analysis, are gonna be another thing. Uh, we have social interpersonal, like I was counseling this young lady about. Uh, we have motor intelligence. Dr. Carson couldn't be the brilliant surgeon he is if he didn't have the kind of learning of motor skills that he has. It's a very important kind of intelligence. That's why I'm not a neurosurgeon. You don't want Sadie Klutz mucking around in your brain. Uh, so, uh, and then there's, then there's this meta, this meta self and intrapersonal that we talked about, about knowing about yourself. How, wh how do I work? What's my good, what are my strengths? And every, every woman who uh, gets to her teens uh, has this kind of knowledge of her appearance to know what's the best hairstyle and what colors are my good colors? You have to do the same thing with your brain function to analyze how your brain can be optimized. Um, another thing that's very important, and I always like to get this across in any lecture, auditory has three other features other than what we say is auditory when we do educational testing. Speech sounds are in the left side of your brain, on the right side of your brain, in the same location, the temporal lobe, You've got three other things. Music, people can be plus minus on music, and identifying environmental sounds, knowing which is your cell phone ring, knowing altogether whether it's a doorbell or a phone or a dog barking or whatever. That's processed on the right side. And tone of voice. Is a person angry with me? Is a person happy with me? All of those things. Uh, so we have a lot of auditory that is not language, and uh, I think we do people a disservice when we use the imprecise vocabulary of saying, oh, this child has an auditory uh, perceptual problem, um, because then I have actually had the experience of parents coming in and saying, oh, my son loves music, but you know he has a reading problem? And they told me that he has auditory problems, so I don't let him take music lessons. You just want to sink right through the floor <laughs> when you hear that, you know. So this is why knowing something about the brain has some practical significance, is that you're, you know, you're condemning this kid to not having music lessons. That might actually be his career, because he has problems with phonological, that is speech sound issues. So this is why it's very important that there are all these different kinds of intelligence. But what allows you to use them and to take them into action is your executive function, uh, which I said is this huge frontal lobe that we have and uh, which some people are more slowly developing in than other people. And this is, this is the main 
point I'm trying to make is that we need to recognize who those people are. And I know that there are always, particularly fathers, fathers come to the office and they say, well, he has to do this by himself sometime, you know, and you say yes, you know, and, uh, you know, kids have to learn to cross the street by themselves sometime, but we generally don't let two-year-olds do it. We generally think of the concept of readiness. Now, so we need to stretch that concept of readiness to, and this sometime uh, is not the same time for every single uh, individual. Uh, so we, yes, we do have to do more supervision, structure, and positive reinforcement for the people whose frontal lobes and executive function based on those frontal lobes are lagging behind the other kids. And we have to think about our curriculum not just in terms of content and core, this and core, but how and when, how and when. And there, there's, I know there, there is, in, because I hang out now with teachers all the time, I know that there is this beautiful concept of universal design. But we've got to mean that. We've got to really mean universal design. That yes, we have our core curriculum, but we have in a given classroom, children who are at very, very different developmental levels, even if they're not dyslexic or learning disabled in the traditional way, this frontal lobe and executive piece is so overlooked. And then we use these moral turpitude words about it all the time. We say, you're in middle school. You are supposed to take responsibility, you know, <laughs> and you are in charge and you are. Yeah, but my brain is not ready to do that. And that is, and, and then of course, we, be, middle school being of course on the brink of all those wonderful hormonal things, you know, we are also gonna be in a lot of trouble. Um, I want, I'm gonna stop now and just tell you, uh, since I started talking about ADHD, and I segued into saying executive function is such an enormous, and I would say long lasting lag, um, what about stimulants? One sentence, they're not a cure, they're not a curse. Stimulants are helpful. I like very much what one of my fellow teachers says. Stimulants help to make kids become reachable and teachable. <laughs> but that's not the whole nine yards. Um, we individualize the medication for target symptoms. It's very flexible. It's an illustration of the art of medicine. There is no right dose of a stimulant for a given person, even at a given age. Uh, I have some uh, long time followed up patients who took stimulants pretty regularly when they were in elementary school, took it less. Now they're in college and they take a stimulant dosage only when they're studying for exams or writing a term paper. Otherwise they don't take it. They take it more or less the way I get black coffee when I need to do my income tax, <laughs> you know? I mean, it really is quite analogous. In other, and, and by the way, caffeine is a darn good stimulant. You know why we don't use it much more? What happens about 90 minutes after you drink coffee? Got to run to the bathroom. <laughs> it's a problem. But the stimulants that are available in the pill form don't have that same effect. Caffeine is, has the virtue of being easy to buy and it's around, et cetera. But you can only get about 90 minutes before you gotta go for the nearest bathroom. So you, it's, not, it's not very, it's longevity to keep you concentrating and sitting at your desk is not optimal. Um, uh, I'm gonna leave out some of these more medical things. Um, even when we study uh, large groups of kids, we find that if we combine behavioral treatment with the pharmacological, we get better results if people are oppositional or aggressive, if they are depressed, if they have social skills problems, if they have reading problems, and if they have parent-child problems. In other words, most of the time, combining. <laughs> because the pure cases that are, don't have any of these problems are, are, are not clinically very numerous. So we like to combine it with behavioral uh, interventions. And the most important one is a positively oriented behavior modification program. How many people here have had any training in um, what I'm calling positively oriented behavior modification? Some, a few people. 
One of the best ways to do it is to get a dog and learn modern dog training. I'm telling you, it is fantastic to teach you the, the principles of, you know, we've, we no longer are going around whacking dogs with the newspaper and jerking on their neck and all that kind of stuff. And it's really amazing. Um, so the ABC of applied behavior analysis is something I think every classroom teacher needs to know for children in general. But if you have some of these kids who are clearly so immature, you can do so much good understanding the principles of applied behavior analysis. And the ABC, the A stands for antecedents. That would be your universal design. What am I going to ask this person to do? Am I asking the person to do something that's at that person's capability level so that success can be achieved? B is what the kid does, the behavior. And C is the consequence. And what we want to get across is we want to skew the consequences toward the positive. We want to try as much as possible to have, for instance, if you divide up the day in a behavior contract and you have, instead of taking points away, just leave it blank. You know, it's like when your mother said, if you didn't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. We're trying to get the whole valence of consequences to be either neutral or positive, neutral or positive, because the brain releases dopamine with the positive, and that strengthens the learning connections. So I'm going to stop here, and is that okay, Nancy? We'll entertain questions. Do you want to tell them? Uh, if anybody wants this other one, I'll have send it. <laughs> no, it has a lot of overlap. The other, one, the other one was very focused specifically on how this plays out in reading. So it's, it, it has a lot of the same things, but. And you know, um, <laughs> it's fine to know the anatomy of the brain, but the implications of the anatomy and um, how it affects learning and how it affects teaching and how, in, in the most important way, affects student success is what we're really interested in. So Dr. Dankla has seen thousands of children. I have referred many children to her over my career. And um, it's not only helping the child, but it's also helping the parents in a very significant way. So.